We're in Jerusalem, it's early morning. The sun rose only an hour or so ago. I've come here to this garden tomb to visit a grave. A very special grave, some people would say. They say this is where the body of Jesus was buried after his death on a cross. Other people say it can't possibly be his grave. Well, the truth is nobody knows whether it is or it isn't. What is true is that thousands of followers of Jesus, Christians, come here on pilgrimage every year. But this is a new thing. The tomb was only discovered 150 years ago. Less than a kilometre away is a church, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Some people say that's where Jesus was buried. Christians have been going there for 1700 years. What's strange is that 2,000 years ago, the very first followers of Jesus didn't come to Jerusalem on pilgrimages at all. They showed no interest in the tomb of Jesus. They didn't set up stone shrines, bring offerings, or build a church. In fact, they were more intent on getting out of Jerusalem, traveling all across the Middle East, into Europe and as far away as Rome, telling people about Jesus, the Messiah, the Christ, who he was, what he had done. Some people say, of course they didn't come. Why would they? Jesus didn't die in Jerusalem. And if he didn't die here, he wasn't buried here. But the followers of Jesus then and now say very clearly that Jesus did die in Jerusalem. They say he died on a cross a short distance from where I'm standing. He was buried either here or close by. And then they say, he came back to life. He rose from the dead. He was resurrected. Is that why the first followers of Jesus didn't come to his tomb? How would we know? If you want to understand anything about what Christians believe, you cannot ignore the cross. Wherever you go in the world, wherever there are followers of Jesus, you will always find the cross. The Silvay in the days of the Mula Mudukle, Ladli na Pakra. The Silvay Patina Pesamo, the Enetherina Kadabal Manshan Mela Vachirka Anbu. The Bibi became a Mela Pacific and Ivaretaka, now Loma Levunicalo, Kena Kena Sambukodi. It's fundamental to our understanding of salvation that Jesus died on the cross for the whole world. Jesus. Salib adalah penting kepada ku kerana tiada Yesus tiada makna dalam kehidupan saya. The cross has in fact been important for Christians for 2000 years. You can trace its significance back down through every century right back to the first century. In the part of the Bible we call the New Testament, we find more than 70 references to Jesus dying on a cross. If you read the four historical accounts of the life of Jesus, they focus on his death and on his resurrection. These are all first century writings. They were written not long after the events they describe. It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly exhibited as crucified. We are witnesses of everything he did. They killed him by hanging him on a cross. 
When these first Christians wrote about the death of Jesus on a cross, they wrote about it as a historical fact, something that really happened, an event based on eyewitness accounts. And in time, it was the cross that became the most important visible symbol of the Christian faith. We find that from the earliest ages, Christians have used the cross as a symbol. In a bakery in Pompeii in the first century, for instance, or on the graves of Christians, especially of martyrs in the catacombs, uh, on signet rings as a means of identification. We also know that the sign of the cross was used in a particular way to signify the term cross or crucify in manuscripts uh, from the second century towards the end of the second century onwards. Christians used the symbol of the cross in their daily living. Tertullian tells us, at every forward step and movement, at every going in and out, when we put on our clothes and shoes, when we bathe, when we sit at table, when we light the lamps, in lying down, in sitting down, in all the ordinary actions of daily life, we trace the sign upon our forehead. This is all historical evidence that Christians in the first, second and third centuries talked to each other about the cross of Jesus, wrote about the cross of Jesus and used it as a symbol of their faith. But we need to go deeper than that. How can we be sure that what they said is true? Basically, how can we know whether or not Jesus died? What evidence is there? And if he did die, and if he did rise from the dead here in Jerusalem, what does that mean? We know that Jesus came to Jerusalem on several occasions. He was born in Bethlehem, 10 kilometers south of here, and his family brought him to the temple in Jerusalem when he was still a baby. His family then moved north to the town of Nazareth, but we know he came again when he was 12 years old. Even at that age, he astonished the religious leaders with his knowledge about God. Around the age of 30, he became a teacher. People were amazed at the things he said. Huge crowds gathered to see the miracles and the healings that he did. Crowds followed him all over the place. And out of those crowds, he called some to be particularly close to him. Peter and John and James and Thomas and Judas, who later betrayed him. There are many others who supported and followed him, including quite a number of women, uh, Mary, uh, Salome, Susanna, others who are named in these accounts of Jesus' life. It's highly likely that Jesus and these close followers came to Jerusalem more than once a year. They came to celebrate important Jewish festivals. One of these, the Passover, is still celebrated by Jews in March or April every year. It's a celebration with its roots in ancient history, way before the time of Jesus. You can read the story in the very early chapters of the Bible, the part we call the Old Testament. It's a story about Moses and how God rescued his people from slavery. About 3,000 years ago, there was a king in Egypt who was very evil. He was oppressing a whole people and an ethnic group, the Hebrews, in his country and exploiting them as slaves. Moses asked the king of Egypt to let those people go free, but he refused. So God said, enough is enough. Uh, these people have suffered long enough and he was going to bring them out. So he gave instructions through Moses. God is going to rescue you. He will pass through the land and strike down the Egyptians. Go at once. Find a lamb and kill that lamb. Then take some of its blood and put it on the doorposts of your homes. Do not go out. When God comes, he will see the blood 
and he will pass over your houses. So on that night, uh, the Israelites left Egypt and God gave them liberation. They were freed and they were freed from death and they were freed from slavery because of the blood of the Passover lamb. The last time Jesus came to Jerusalem, this Passover was the event he and his friends, Peter and John and James, Thomas, Judas and others came to celebrate. They met in an upper room somewhere in the city. And it turned out to be an extraordinary, dramatic and unforgettable evening. That evening, Jesus talked a lot about his death. He talked about his blood being shed for others, his body being broken. He said his time had come. Jesus was both a teacher and a prophet, and this was not the first time he'd prophesied his own death. He had said he was going to suffer many things, that he would be killed, and on the third day be raised back to life. I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. As a prophet, he prophesies, he speaks about what was going to happen. Three times, uh, he explicitly uh, predicts that uh, he's going to Jerusalem and he will be arrested and he will, he will suffer uh, a horrible death. After the Passover meal later that evening, Jesus led his followers out of Jerusalem across the Kidron Valley to a local hillside, the Mount of Olives, where he stopped to pray. The garden where I'm standing is close to where Jesus stopped that night. Its name is Gethsemane, the place of the oil press. It's a place Jesus knew well. He'd often meet here with his followers. This particular evening, Jesus leaves his friends, walks on alone, and then falls to the ground to pray. Now, there's nothing special about the way Jesus prays. He frequently prays and in different ways. It's what he says that's important. Going a little further, he threw himself on the ground and prayed, Father, remove this cup from me, yet not what I want, but what you want. In his anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down on the ground. The stories that we have, the written accounts of the life and death of, of, of Jesus, are really um, very consistent. It was a time of real major stress for him. Um, the Bible's account, in fact, is that uh, his sweat became like great drops of blood. Medically, that's a very unusual condition, but it is recognised. It's called hematohydrosis. It's not a normal or a common condition for doctors to see, but it is a recognised condition, and it has been documented in the scientific literature to occur in prisoners who are facing execution. Under this huge burden of stress, Jesus prays. What does he say? Yet yeah, not what I want, but what you, God, want. When soldiers come to arrest him a short while later, he's abandoned by his friends. He stands alone. He deliberately chooses to go with the soldiers, knowing he's going to his death, rather than fleeing with his friends. From Gethsemane, the soldiers took Jesus back across the Kidron Valley into the city. Throughout the night, he was given no sleep and was forced to march from one place to another. The Jewish leaders put him on trial three times. It was they who had ordered his arrest. His teachings and popularity threatened their position with their own people and with the Roman rulers. Then he was questioned by Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor, after that, a local ruler, Herod, interrogated him. And early in the morning, he was finally brought back to the Roman governor. What shall I do with him? Pilate asked the people. Crucify him, they shouted. Why, what's his crime? asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder. Crucify him! 
wanting to satisfy the crowd, Pilate had Jesus whipped and handed him over to be crucified. The Roman whipping that Jesus received was a horrendous ordeal. The injuries and major loss of blood were enough to kill a man. The whip had multiple leather thongs with metal or bone implants. These ripped at the flesh, mutilated the back muscles. Jesus did survive, but after suffering from huge stress and abuse at his trials, he was now teetering on the very edge of death. During the course of the night, uh, he went through uh, six trials under the Jewish and the Roman authorities. He was spat upon, he was beaten. The whip would have resulted in major uh, disruption, laceration, uh, opening of the soft tissues. Ultimately, these events together would have led to the beginning of breakdown in his body systems. The Romans made their victims carry the crossbeams of their crosses to the place where they were going to be crucified outside the city walls. For Jesus, this was probably no more than five or six hundred meters. Now, that's a short distance for a healthy man in his early thirties, but Jesus was no longer in that condition. He was so weakened by that stage as a result of the emotional stress and the blood loss that he stumbled along the way and was unable to complete that, the carrying of the cross himself. Eventually, he was taken by the Roman authorities to the place of execution, a place called Golgotha, or what we know as the place of the skull. The place of the skull? In Jerusalem, there is such a place. It's about a kilometer from the Garden of Gethsemane, just outside the city walls. A small rock face where you can see the eye sockets and nose of a human skull. Christians believe that this is the place where Jesus was crucified. At Golgotha, Jesus was hung on his cross. Iron spikes were hammered into his wrists, securing him to the crossbeam. Jesus and the crossbeam were then hauled up and fixed to the upright of the cross. His back, already raw with the whipping, was pressed hard against the rough wood. Finally, his legs were bent on one side and his feet fixed firmly in place. Every breath would have been an agony for Jesus. Breathing scraped open the wounds on his back. The rise and fall of his body rotated his wrists around the iron spikes, causing pain to shoot along his arms. His muscles seized up, and fatigue slowly took away what remained of his strength. We know that at the foot of the cross stood his mother, some of his followers, and his Roman guards. A group of witnesses, all watching him die. After this, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, It is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. It is finished. It is finished. It is finished. So, did Jesus really die on the cross? Well, Christians from all around the world say that he definitely did. But how can they be so sure? You see, there are two basic theories that argue that Jesus didn't really die on the cross. One is the swoon theory. Simply put, Jesus appeared to be dead, but he wasn't. When he was taken down and put in his grave, he revived. The second theory, the substitution theory, is a little bit more complex. People say someone else was substituted for Jesus on the cross. The theory is that he didn't die on the cross because he wasn't on the cross at all. So what is the historical evidence for the death of Jesus? The death of Jesus is a historical fact and is based on uh, eyewitness accounts of the event. 
In fact, one of those accounts makes it quite clear. He says, I was there, I saw it happen. It was a public event, publicly witnessed within human history. You might, of course, expect the first followers of Jesus to say he died. Isn't that what Christians believe? But there are also non-Christian historians who say exactly the same thing. We have a testimony that Jesus died on the cross, not only from his friends, um, but also from those who were his enemies. So we have a testimony from the Roman historian Tacitus about the death of Jesus under Pontius Pilate, uh, who was then the governor of Judea. Christus suffered the extreme penalty at the hands of one of our procurators, Pontius Pilate. And a most mischievous superstition broke out, not only in Judea, but even in Rome. This is reinforced by the testimony of the Talmud, relying on accounts of Jesus' death from a Jewish point of view from the earliest days. There is a Jewish historian, his name is Josephus, he's not a Christian. He was writing the history of the Jewish people and around about 93 AD, he categorically states about Jesus of Nazareth and how he died in Jerusalem. At this time, there was a wise man called Jesus, and he was known to be virtuous. Pilate condemned him to be crucified and to die. But those who had become his followers reported that he had appeared to them three days after his crucifixion and that he was alive. All this historical evidence points to the fact that Jesus died in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago. But what about the substitution theory? Can you argue that, yes, someone died on a cross, but it definitely wasn't Jesus? Is there anything in the Jesus accounts to help us decide? We know that there were people who knew Jesus very well who were present at the crucifixion, his own mother, those who had followed him, those who were particularly close to him. They certainly would have spotted any substitution very quickly. The Romans who had responsibility to execute him uh, would have been in severe trouble if they executed the wrong person. But then if somehow someone had been substituted for Jesus, they would have made very loud protests that they were not Jesus. There were no protests. The Roman guards were not punished. Uh, there is absolutely nothing in the accounts to even suggest that it wasn't Jesus on the cross that day. And what of Jesus himself? He was a great prophet, talking about God's justice and God's love. How could he tolerate someone facing the horrors of crucifixion instead of him? So what about the swoon theory? Jesus was on the cross, but he didn't die. Is that believable? Whilst the written evidence that we have about the death of Jesus came from those who witnessed the event, really the strongest evidence for his death comes because of the Roman soldiers who had witnessed the death. Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council, went to Pontius Pilate and requested the body of Jesus for burial. When Pilate learned from one of the soldiers that Jesus had been dead for some time, he granted the body to Joseph. They had no reason to lie. They weren't personally followers. These were simply guys doing their job. And it was Pilate, who was the Roman governor of the time, who confirmed uh, the death of Christ. Another common claim is that Jesus wasn't on the cross long enough to die. Crucifixion was a slow, cruel death. Victims died of asphyxiation, which could take up to four days. We know Jesus was only on the cross for around six hours, from nine in the morning until three in the afternoon the same day. Is it medically possible that he could die so quickly? When I come to read the stories and the accounts of the death of, of Jesus, as a doctor, there's nothing that surprises me there. It was a death that resulted from abuse and from a short period of suffering and of violence and ultimately of crucifixion. Medically, there would have been an, an abnormal uh, gases in the blood of Jesus on the cross, reduction in oxygen, an increase in carbon dioxide, a change in the salt levels in the blood which would have resulted in all likelihood in abnormal rhythms of the heart and the sudden catastrophic uh, death of Christ. 
This, however, is not the end of the account. The Romans were very proficient in crucifixion. If they wanted to speed up the death, they simply broke the legs of their victims. Within three or four minutes, the victims would be dead. However, the Bible tells us that when the soldiers came to break Jesus' legs, he was already dead. So they did what you'd expect. They made sure he was. The Jews did not want a body left on a cross during the Sabbath, their holy day. So they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified men broken and their bodies removed. But when they came to Jesus, they saw that he was already dead, so they didn't break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once blood and water came out. When they pushed that spear into uh, Jesus' side, the writer tells us that blood and water came out. Medically that's important, that's significant, because that would be expected to happen, for example, when either the lining of Jesus' heart or the heart itself was punctured. Medically there's nothing in what I read in the accounts of the death of Jesus Christ that suggests anything other than he died, and he died as a result of the crucifixion. All the historical and medical evidence points to the fact that it was Jesus who did die here in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago. But why is that important? You know, plenty of people died on crosses under Roman rule. Why was this death different? What difference does it make to me or to you? Jesus died on the cross to save us. That's the very simple message of the Bible. Our relationship with God was broken that needed to be put right, and the death of Jesus was the way that God put that right. Christians firmly believe that Jesus was not just a man. He was and is the Son of God. He had and has the nature of God himself. To understand why Jesus died, we must go back to the Bible. One of the things we find in the Bible is that there are many different pictures, many different images to explain to us why Jesus died. We have a line in one of the biblical books, the letter to the church in Rome, where the writer goes from a picture of a law court of someone being declared not guilty, straight to a picture of a slave market, of someone paying the price to set someone free from slavery, straight to the picture of a temple and a sacrifice. Different pictures that together help to give us an idea of just how much Jesus has done for us in dying on the cross. These are not simply ideas that originated centuries after Jesus' death, or even started with the very first Christians. In fact, some of them go back hundreds of years before Jesus was even born. Back to stories of Abraham and Moses, Adam and Eve, and to one of the great prophets, Isaiah. Ancient stories and prophecies that teach us about sacrifice and how God saves his people. In his lifetime, Jesus was called Messiah. He was the Word of God, the light of the world, but he was also given what seems a very strange name. His followers called him the Lamb of God. We see John the Baptist uh, calling him uh, the Lamb of God. Uh, that takes away the sin of the world. In a letter written to the Christians in the city of Corinth, which is in modern Greece, uh, it says that Jesus is like the Passover lamb that was slain for us. Jesus is called Lamb of God 20 or more times in biblical texts, and they're significant texts. It really matters to understand who Jesus is, that we know that he is the Lamb of God. You know that you were redeemed with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. For me, to think of Jesus as the Lamb of God from the Old Testament takes us, of course, back to the Passover where the lamb was slain so that the Israelites could go free. Before he died, Jesus entered Jerusalem with his followers and they started celebrating the Passover as traditionally Jews would have. 
But then Jesus changed what was going on. He started taking some of the symbolic food on the table and changing its meaning. Jesus said to his followers, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. And he took bread and broke it, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took a cup, saying, Drink. This is my blood which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Jesus somehow interpreted his death in terms of the Passover sacrifice. He was in a way saying that uh, I am in my, in my death, I am the, the Passover lamb. From now on, they would remember his death as setting them free. There's another story in the Old Testament that helps us to understand why Jesus is the Lamb of God. It's a story of Abraham, which many Christians believe took place on the hill behind me at the center of Jerusalem. In the Old Testament story, God tests Abraham. He asks Abraham to sacrifice his own son. Dramatically, at the very last moment, God intervenes. An alternative sacrifice is provided for by God and Abraham's son is set free. The angel of God called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, do not harm the boy. Now I know you fear God. Abraham looked up and in a bush he saw a male sheep caught by its horns. Then he took the sheep and sacrificed it instead of his son. God tests Abraham to see if he will obey him. When he does, God doesn't just tell him to free his son and then everything's fine. Simply being obedient to God's will isn't sufficient. A sacrifice is still needed. God provides a sheep. The story of the Passover reminds us that a lamb was sacrificed so that people could go free. The story of Abraham tells us that it is God who provides the sacrifice. The prophet Isaiah, writing six to seven hundred years before Jesus was born, adds a third picture of a lamb being sacrificed. But in this picture, the lamb represents an unidentified man who will die to save others. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. But he was pierced for our transgressions, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. In the New Testament, John the baptizer, another prophet, makes a similar prophecy. According to both Isaiah and John, there's a connection between the death of the Lamb of God, Jesus, and the wrong things we all do, our sin. The next day, John saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Look, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Every culture across the world and down through history has known the reality of sin, of human wrongdoing. In many Eastern countries, uh, because the community is so strong, if you go against what the community believes is right, then you have this idea that you've shamed not just yourself, but your relatives, your family, and the wider community. In other cultures, more often associated with the West, sin and wrongdoing are often thought of more in legal terms of guilt. We've described it differently, but whether guilt or shame, the reality is still, I failed. And that's the fundamental problem for all human beings. 
Christians come from different cultures all around the world. What unites them is an understanding of how shame and guilt, sin, ruins relationships. Relationships with family, with friends, and most importantly, our relationship with God. If you go right back to the beginning of the Bible, you find the story of Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve lived in harmony with God, in a beautiful garden, the Garden of Eden. God was not a remote God. Adam and Eve talked with him, walked with him. But then something went terribly wrong. God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good. She took some and she and the man ate it. Then the man and the woman hid from God among the trees of the garden. Adam and Eve went missing. They were too ashamed to meet God because of what they had done. There were serious consequences. They had disobeyed the command of God. They could no longer stay with God in the garden. That perfect relationship with God had broken down. The question is, how is that wonderful relationship with God ever going to be restored? Some people think that by being good, by uh, performing religious acts or by doing uh, the right thing that they deserve to, to go to heaven, that is not possible. No one can do enough good to, to really deserve to go to heaven. God is utterly pure and good and holy. And therefore, there is nothing within us that we can somehow offer to God and say, this will be good enough for God, because it isn't and it can't be. We need God's answer to our problem, not our own efforts. When we read the Bible, we discover God is a holy God, a just God, and a God who is love. The holiness of God is fundamental. God is pure, therefore, the wrong we do is serious. It separates us from God because we're not pure. Holiness is connected to the justice of God. God cannot simply forgive the wrong things we do. Sin cannot go unpunished, or there's no justice. So what's God's solution? The answer is that God is not simply a God of love. He is love. It is love, God himself, that solves the problem. And the supreme expression of God's love for us was Jesus' sacrifice of himself taking the punishment for our sin in dying on the cross. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ, not counting people's sins against them. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Jesus is the Lamb of God provided by God, who loves us. Jesus' sacrifice of himself saves us. He takes away the sin of the world so that we, me and you, can enjoy a new, close, restored relationship with God himself. 2,000 years ago, the death of Jesus on a cross was not the end of the story, of course. We know a man named Joseph of Arimathea received the body of Jesus from Pontius Pilate and took it to his own tomb in a garden close by. Joseph did what he could, but the light was fading. Sunset was around seven o'clock that evening. This marked the beginning of the Jewish holy day and Joseph needed to get back home before it started. He rolled a large stone in front of the entrance to seal it and then went away. Early on the third day, just after sunrise, when the Sabbath was over, three of Jesus' followers, Mary and Salome, with another woman called Mary, brought spices to the tomb to anoint Jesus' body. Then they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away from the entrance to the tomb. As they entered the tomb, they saw an angel dressed in white, and they were frightened. Don't be alarmed, the angel said. You are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. But he is not here. He has risen from the dead. 
After his resurrection, Jesus appeared to Mary and Peter and John. That evening, he met two people walking to their home outside Jerusalem. Then he appeared to his closest followers. He told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations. You are witnesses of these things. About six weeks after his resurrection, Jesus took his followers out of Jerusalem to a hillside. He blessed them, then he was taken up into heaven. But even that's not the end of the story. In the last book of the Bible, there's one final picture of Jesus as the Lamb of God. Uh, John, one of Jesus' closest followers during his lifetime, writes about a vision he had, a vision of heaven. In the vision, he meets Jesus, who tells him, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and now look, I am alive forever and ever. After that, the vision changes. John sees a throne. Then I saw a lamb, looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne, encircled by four living creatures and by 24 elders. And they sang a new song. You were slain, and with your blood, you purchased for God people from every tribe and language and nation. The vision is clear. It's Jesus, the Lamb of God who died on the cross, the Lamb who was slain, who stands at the very center of heaven, surrounded by people from every nation on earth. His death is not a defeat. His resurrection is proof of a victory. Two thousand years ago, a grief-stricken group of men and women watched Jesus die on a cross. They had been with him from the beginning, seen him arrested at Gethsemane, looked on while he was nailed to the cross at Golgotha. They saw a spear thrust into his heart and carried his body to its grave. A few weeks later, they began to travel out of Jerusalem, declaring that the tomb was empty. Jesus had died and they had seen him risen from the dead. Their message was going to change the world. But what made the difference to their lives? What was it that really convinced them that the man they were talking to, sharing meals with, was the man who had died on the cross? That first evening, some of the followers of Jesus were together. Then Jesus came to them. He showed them where the nails had pierced him and his side where a spear had been thrust into him. They were overjoyed to see him. Thomas, another of Jesus' followers, was not there that evening. He refused to believe they had seen Jesus risen from the dead. A week later, Jesus came again. Then Jesus said to Thomas, See my hands. Put your finger where the nails were. Put your hand into my side. Stop doubting. Believe. Thomas said, My Lord, my God. Jesus asked him, Have you believed because you see me? Blessed are those who have not seen, and yet they believe. 